So I'm going to just give a very brief introduction to this particular event, but I want to thank all of you so much for joining us for what is our final event in a year-long series sponsored by the Levin Institute called On Writing. Um, this series was kind of suggested to us by Daniela Bleichmar, who's the director of the Levin Institute, who unfortunately can't be with us today. Uh, and she, she indicated that of all the topics that she had pulled USC faculty on related to the humanities, people seemed most interested in just wanting to have more conversations amongst each other about writing, as it were. So this is the sixth event now. Um, if you haven't been able to join us for some of the previous ones, there are links to recordings of them on the Levin website. And David Yulin and myself have co-convened these and they've really been the bright spot for us in this year. We've talked to an amazing range of people on an amazing range of subjects, including process, um, form, flexibility thereof, uh, editing, the, the list goes on. It gives me incredible pleasure then to kind of wrap up this year long series as it were with a conversation that is itself a conversation between two brilliant preeminent writers about how they enact all the various topics that we've spent the year looking at in say a more granular way. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to David Yulin to do those formal introductions and kick us off. And I'll just say finally, uh, I, again, a resounding thank you to the Levin Institute and Daniela and Isabella for facilitating this, for inspiring this, and to all of you for being um, devoted participants in this series as we've uh, coordinated it throughout the year. Thank you and David. Sorry, I forgot to turn off mute. Um, thanks, Emily, and welcome to everyone, particularly those of you on the uh, West Coast. This is a breakfast conversation, um, and, um, and I'm really grateful that everybody's here. I just want to very quickly introduce Maggie and Hari. Um, this is a real pleasure and I think a privilege for me. These are two of the most exceptional writers working at the moment, and um, to have the opportunity to see them in conversation about writing and craft and all you know, whatever, wherever the conversation goes is something that I think is, um, is really thrilling. So I first want to just thank uh, Maggie and Hari for being here. And then I want to echo, <clears throat> excuse me, what Emily was saying about the series. The series has gone in all of these really interesting and unexpected ways, um, like I think all of the, my favorite collaborations and um, has kind of created its own sort of narrative over the course of the, the, the school year. Um, and this feels like a really um, compelling and vivid way to close it out. So I will not belabor things. I'm just going to say um, I do want to mention that Maggie, uh, Maggie Nelson has a new book coming out um, in September called On Freedom for Songs of Care and Constraint. Um, brilliant theorist, brilliant narrative writer, brilliant nonfiction writer. Uh, and Hari Kunzru is, I think, one of the most um, interesting and provocative novelists working now. His most recent novel, Red Pill, um, looks into sort of paranoia and uh, alt-right politics and identity and all kinds of things. Um, also, uh, the author of White Tears, um, Gods Without Men, one of my favorite books about the liminality of experience. Uh, and a number of other novels. So I'm gonna get out of the way now and let uh, Maggie and Hari take it away. And thank you both for being here and thank everybody in the audience for being here. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. All right, I'm gonna try and make it so I can I make Hari bigger because we've never met. And so I can't bear to meet you, Hari, in a box this small. So <laughs> Second, let me see. Okay. I've seen you, Maggie. I've got. I've oh, made great. you bigger. I've Wonderful. Seen you. Okay. Now I see you bigger, and I'm thrilled. Um, I'm so glad to meet you. And it's very funny to be doing things like this, uh, like meeting people for the first time uh, amongst others and uh, on Zoom. But I'm thrilled. So thank you so much for talking. <laughs> Likewise. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, yeah. I'm a big fan, and it's a real pleasure to have this chance to talk to you. 
Well, I see, um, and you guys can probably see, like, if you were on Room Raider, I'm gonna, we're gonna give you like the big thumbs up, but also the thumbs up because Hari has his book, as I do, um, uh, in VO, and it's so great. And I want to talk about a book, but I want to talk about a lot of other things too. So, and like I said, for all of you guys listening, um, we don't know each other, so I, and it's like I have so many things I love to talk about, and you guys will get a chance to ask questions later. And I see a lot of people I know. And the participants so that's I know there are a lot of um, smart and interesting people who are going to want to ask things too so I'll just I'll just start off where I want to start off because I get to do that and uh, I just thought um, you know ironically because we're doing we're meeting each other on zoom uh, as I said in the presence of other people but I thought we could start talking off talking about privacy um, just because one of my very favorite parts of um, red pill is the description of your narrator for those who haven't read it uh, arriving at a writing residency in germany and then realizing with slow um, rolling horror that all the writing is supposed to be done in a shared setting with all the other residents eyes upon him so he's not going to have the, the writing privacy that he dreamed of and i just wanted to say that these passages alone would make red pill qualify for like uh, an award for the best horror writing <laughs> It is such a hor horror show. Um, but it made me think a lot about writing under surveillance and or under the feeling of being observed. And I was also thinking of Emily co-hosting who wrote this great essay earlier this year about the pandemic and about having kids around called No Room of One's Own. And I just thought, I wondered how, um, you know, on a pragmatic or even domestic level, how the toll on privacy, if that is what there has been, has played out for you. Um, uh, yeah, <clears throat> this is where this is where I have to fess fess up that, that, that some some good moves got made before the pandemic. You know, I uh, uh, I have two smallish children, eight mm -hmm. and four, and my wife Katie Kutamura is a is a novelist as well, um, and we're very used to to being at home and working at home in in a domestic space. So I I think the shock for us has been rather less than it has been for. Mm -hmm some other people i mean back when we first got together we did both write novels in the same room at desks facing in opposite directions that's not because of some you know performative wish to say how great our relationship was it was just because we're in a tiny new york studio with no money to rent office space but we you know as you, as you can see from my kind of authoritarian wall of books behind me i now have a, a proper writing space it's even you know it's even got a there's a window, there's, you know, there's, there's, yeah, it's everything, you know, everything that I could want for my little kind of pod like world. And, uh, I mean, the, th the thing that I've always felt when I'm asked this question, slightly kind of embarrassed to admit is that the sitter lives downstairs. So we have been quarantined with childcare and that is the, that's the, you know, the, the invisible part that actually has made it a, 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 a a productive year rather than a year of total meltdown so um it has been it has been not as bad for us as i think it has been for a lot of a lot of other people i mean i i'm sort of intermittently social mm -hmm. i would say you know i can i can i can do it and and, and i like <laughs> doing i drift drift off back into my own thing and I've I've sort of taken the view that this you know for a couple of years I'll mainly be in my head and mm -hmm. with you know ones close to me that I I love and then you know I will kind of crawl back out into the light and and remind myself what it's like to be you know drinking room temperature white wine at a book party <laughs> yeah well actually that is one of my other questions which is just something that I mean, and we will get into, you know, more writing specific things or more politically specific things, but just, just for starting off, I'm curious about, you know, I have my partner released a book in pandemic times, although sadly on March 17th, which was really like not as good a time <laughs> as maybe the fall, but I've, you know, as I'm sure you've been doing many things like this and so have I, you know, it's made me think a lot and I'm really curious to know what you think about you know, as all the procedurals of kind of the public aspect of a writer's life, you know, like the dinners, book fairs, book signings, weird Q and A's with 
people stumbling over to a microphone, you know, as all that has, you know, evaporated and we're here <laughs> alone in our chambers. I wonder, you know, have you thought about, um, like, do you feel like this, A, do you, do you need and want this kind of exchange as nourishing to an intellectual life? And B, do you feel like the action of it can be had in these forums? Like if this were all we had, would it be good enough? Or what do you make of the loss of that interstitial experience? It's, I know the, 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 the terrible sadness will come when the leave meeting button gets pressed. Right. Because that, <laughs> that, right. That's always the thing that I find slightly traumatic because normally you know we're on right now like here we are we're being yeah. our sparkly best and we're you know performing ourselves you know hopefully in an interesting way for for an, for an audience and 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 you know you, you put all that energy in and you you know you you talk you talk to someone in the slightly formal way of a stage conversation and then the button gets pressed and then you're just back on your own and yeah. whereas normally you know you'd go to the bar you'd go you maybe somebody nice would take you out for dinner you know there would be a kind of there would it would it would have a much more sort of natural rhythm to it yeah. and certainly for me I mean I yeah I published this novel last fall and uh and yeah I wanted to feel I, I wanted an experience of bringing it out into the world rather than still being in my room I mean this is this is the experience I have when I'm teaching this is the experience I have when I'm talking to my family in England who I haven't seen for a year and a half this is you know this is this is everything and it, it doesn't have all the different textures that you need for a kind of fulfilling social life you know, it's a straightforward tool for, for having a conversation of this kind and for doing things like seminar teaching. I think it's pretty good. You know, I haven't, uh, I, I, I think I've managed to, you know, to, to do some good things in this, in this format, but mm -hmm. I, I do, I do miss the, yeah, I miss, I miss sitting in a restaurant and, you know, talking out of school with, you know, what we would probably do afterwards, you know, if, if, if this was a normal, a normal year. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like then that the part of book publishing where after the kind of solitary sojourn where there's a public enmeshment is like, do you conceive of them as part of, you know, two, two flip sides of the same coin that you, that you desire, or would you be happy if the latter one you know. I, I mean, like like I say, I'm intermittently social, so I do. I quite like the bit where I go forth into the into the world, and and slightly random things happen to me. I mean, I I like the, uh, the strangeness that happens when you, you encounter people, and 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 you have a sense of of what it is that you you know your work is, you know, I don't know the world that your work has got in, involved in, and and I certainly after being you know, going through that process of writing a book, I need to take some kind of lap out in, in the world to, you know, wave at everybody. And, so, you know, and then, I mean, often I then just feel sort of slightly cowed and, and embarrassed and need to go back in and write another. But um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, I, you know, I'm, I have, I'm looking forward to other things more. I'm looking forward to just being able to travel and see family and, you know, the, the grandparents haven't seen their grandchildren since 2019. And that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's tough on, on them. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, I would quite like to stand on a, on a high hill far away from, from other people and, and, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. 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 I mean, Sticking with more of the, I mean, still thinking about privacy or, or surveillance, just because it's so at issue in Red Pill. Um, there's a, and, and you have to forgive me because twice in these questions, I'm like quoting my forthcoming book, but that's only because it's just like the quickest way that I've already said it. So I don't have to re-say it again. So I just wanted to read to you something that I, in the chapter I have about art and freedom. I write, um, as Adam Phillips notes, we can never be entirely free of surveillance of some kind or another, and not always from the usual suspects. But that doesn't mean we don't have a real need to create spaces or forms wherein we can temporarily suspend its grip and practice a certain fugitivity from cops in the head, as Augusta Bawal, founder of the Theater of the Absurd, put it. And then I go on to quote Augusta Bawal saying, um, the cops may be in our heads, but the headquarters of the cops are in external reality. 
Boal says it's necessary to locate both the cops and their headquarters. And I just, I kept thinking about this quote when I was um, reading Red Pill, and I know that I'm putting you on the spot because, uh, you know, I'm just reading it to you for probably the first time, but I just wonder if it brings up any ideas in that relate to the book. Ab well, absolutely. I mean, the, the starting point for the novel was exactly that question, the, the kind of reduction of our space of privacy because of, you know, electronic surveillance and so on. I mean, mm -hmm. I think we've got so used to the idea that we are always at least potentially being overheard and being watched that it has really sort of reduced the the scope of our of our sphere of, of privacy and and that's important because we you know it, it's a space to experiment it's a space to just sort of try out things before you have to bring them into the world and i think our i think that act of stepping forward out of your privacy into the public space is the fundamental act of freedom. I mean, it's, you know, it's to choose when to show yourself, to choose how to show yourself. And, um, and you know, alongside the very straightforward things of, you know, somebody knowing where you are or being able to hear things that you say, there is a sense that I think that, that the, the, the social media landscape, the tech landscape more generally mm -hmm. is, is, is kind of, is making channels, is providing, is providing a sort of grammar in which we are being taught to express ourselves so that even inside in this private space, mm -hmm. we're, we're producing versions of ourselves that at least potentially will be usable by these systems you know wearing i mean it's, it's all about metrication and measurement isn't it it's all it, it's all it's all you know what what is useful to the to the the tech companies is a kind of human behavior that can be aggregated and and packaged and analyzed and and sold you know or, or the information about it can be sold mm -hmm. um so things that are inchoate, things that are unresolved, things that don't have names are not useful. And so we are encouraged to very strongly to, to, to name things, to, to, to give things numbers, to give things, um, to put things in these terms. I mean, there's something Foucault says somewhere in the history of sexuality about how uh, in, in, a, in a sense people are freer before sexual practices and particularly orientations are named before when you know when your feelings are and, and your your desires exist in this kind of un, unreflective way they can just be but if you say i am straight i am gay i am you know a person who likes this those kind of you know contact ad lists of, of fetish preferences or whatever they could be there's a sense in which that's a, 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 a grid that is imprisoning, even though, you know, in that sort of post sixties way, we feel that openness and being able to, to, you know, speak our truth is a, is a, a kind of freedom as well. And I think that's, those two things are in tension with each other. Mm -hmm. I mean, what do you make of the fact that, I mean, because you've written, I mean, I love the part of this book that's the long um, story about, um, the young punk rocker being, I guess, corroded or whatever you know, you are, and you know, recruited by the Stasi in East Germany, and we can talk more about that if people listening don't, um, you know, want to know how that fits into the to Red Pill. But um, but when I was reading it and reading in other books of yours, because obviously, like you know, several books have an interest in. Um, uh, kind of psychological ops on people that 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 bring them into systems of surveillance on on others or on a, on revolutionary groups or on different things. And I I wonder. I mean, without a kind of facile like better or worse now, thumbs up, thumbs down with the internet. I do wonder since you've been kind of a student of these other forms of surveillance. I mean, something I've noticed at least with my kids is you know that when they're taught in their like tech classes, their classes about social media surveilling you and the loss of privacy, you know, their, their first reaction is just like, you guys all feel so unfree. Like what is wrong with you? Just give it all over. And actually you're free. Like, just don't give a crap, you know? And like, they'll say like, God, mom, like, why are you, you know, 
you know, freaking out over your touch ID on your iPhone, like just touch it, just touch it, just get in, get in, you know? And like, but sometimes I think, you know, it's tempting to think, oh, they just don't know. They just don't know, you know, what's awaiting them. Other times I think maybe they're onto something. I don't know. I just wonder if you have thoughts about it. There's, I mean, there's a sort of self-consciousness, isn't there? I mean, in yeah. somewhere in the in in Red Pill, I, I, I quote Sartre. And Sartre has this in, in, in Being in Nothingness, he has this... Uh, example of a peeping tom is somebody mm -hmm. you know, somebody's looking through a keyhole in the yeah, dark yeah, yeah. corridor at something they shouldn't they shouldn't be seeing and and as uh, and they're completely focused on what they're doing they're you know they're they're unself-aware but as soon as there's a noise in the corridor they're suddenly hyper aware of themselves mm -hmm. this possible shame possible discovery and so on mm -hmm. and in, in, he describes that as having the freedom suddenly drained away from you because you are the object of uh uh of the other's gaze um and i think that's that's exactly what we're describing here isn't isn't it i mean there's you know if you don't feel that gaze yeah. then you yeah. can behave as if you were free and whether objectively or not you are free or not is actually not an issue mm -hmm. there i mean somebody i was speaking to yesterday who's tutoring teenagers was so surprised how unself-conscious 15 year olds were in front of uh in front of one of these these zoom meetings you know, here we all are we're kind of slightly you know making sure that we're you know looking correct and professional whatever it would be for a for a conversation and she's saying yeah they've got you know the, whatever angle the screen is at and they don't <laughs> dressed at and and and, and it seemed to be partly just familiarity. I mean, they're, they're used mm -hmm. to sort of just sitting online with their friends all day doing homework and nobody's been able to see each other. So that's, that's the social world, mm -hmm. but, but also a kind of, yeah, I just had these, these kind of considerations that the non digital natives mm -hmm. have are not mm -hmm. there for them, but none of this is to say that, 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 but this is just the experience rather than any kind of objective reality about who's being tracked and who's not being yeah. tracked. And I yeah. think, yeah. you know, we really have only to look at the uses to which this infrastructure is being put in China to understand <laughs> how in a kind of very meaningful and radical way freedom, freedom is a threat from, from pervasive surveillance, you know, at a point where you have networks of cameras you have face recognition software attached to the you know ai's attached to those cameras you have a list of people that you want to track you have certain behaviors that you want to flag up you have systems that are many many times as powerful and efficient as human watches could, that can detect behavior anomalies mm -hmm. absolutely we are heading into a a period and I, and I and I think it's naive to imagine that these things will not come to us and will not be used to us I mean they may come to us in a way which appears that we've given our assent to them you know it may not be imposed by the central politburo it may be you know emerges out of everybody's desire mm -hmm. to be safe mm -hmm. um but it's it's coming and and mm -hmm. you know and I th and I think you know in that very sort of practical way human freedom is is ebbing away um, and what what that means for the future, I'm not I'm not mm -hmm. sure. I mean, I I suspect that it means nothing good. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because your your Twitter feed has been recommended to me many times, and I don't I don't I don't have any social media accounts. And my moment of revelation of kind of what you're talking about is when I learned not so long ago that Facebook also keeps files on people who don't use Facebook. And that to me was like, oh my God, I, I thought I was like off the grid, but they're actually more interested in people like me. <laughs> they also keep a file on, like, why wouldn't you use Facebook? You know, horrifying, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there is, yeah, there's no, there's no sort of pure space of invisibility yeah. left. You know, I mean, you can, yeah. you can, you know, throw away your smartphone and use your virtuous flip phone or whatever it would be. But I mean, there's, yeah, there's no outside. Yeah. I mean, I want to move on a little bit, but I just want to underscore something you said, because I just thought it was so interesting because I've been reading a lot of Hannah Arendt and writing my own book on freedom. And, and, and she talks so much about freedom taking place, you know, for her only in the public sphere, which, you know, I have a lot of issues with, but something, you know, but you're, you're articulating freedom, transpiring precisely when you step out of privacy into the 
public space as a kind of liminality event, I think is very interesting, you know. I mean, it is, it is that it's the it's being able to choose when you present yourself, you know, in, in that in that way that you just sort of slaves and prisoners are not mm -hmm. free because they do not have that mm -hmm. uh, you know, partly because they don't they don't have that ability and you know mm -hmm. and are um you know, in, in being forced to involuntarily present yourself mm -hmm. is is yeah. is always experienced as a as a violation of 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 freedom and, and being able to with withdraw as well mm -hmm. i mean you know we joke we've joked on this call about you know a room of a room of your own but that that is a that's a kind of concrete material mm -hmm. form of being able to assert privacy when you need it i mean yeah. that's you know, it's not just the practical thing of no sound and, and and no no distractions it's a kind of lack of not being observed not having to be mm -hmm. in dialogue with mm -hmm. the they or with the you know the big others sort of sense of who you you are i mean the freedom from Mm -hmm. having to kind of make a coherent presentation of yourself mm -hmm. allows you to experiment and allows you to become rather than just to be fixed according to mm -hmm. you know according to maybe your previous actions i mean we you know we all know the horror stories for, for for younger people now the terrible thing that you do you post as a teenager that follows you around for the rest of your right. of your life um you know, these kind of slightly botched experiments in Europe mm -hmm. with the right to be forgotten, which is a, you know, beautiful idea, but very, very difficult to implement mm -hmm. practically. I mean, I, you know, I'm extremely grateful that I, that I did my teenage years before this global memory, uh, you know, was, was, was sort of dropped down over, yeah. over us all. Yeah. I mean, it's one nice thing about having kids though, is that you just feel like, when you when 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 I like as I just mentioned when I express all my anxieties about this change, you know they kind of remind me that like well that's not how it's going to be for us and they're just like you know and they're just like yeah. they're blithe about it and they're forging on and um, but I wanted to I mean so a lot of my book about freedom I mean not a lot of it but some of it is concerned with what you just described as. Um, the difference or lack of difference between feeling kind of acting as if one were free and then so-called being actually free, you know, and someone I said, like I mentioned, like Hannah Arendt would say, you know, you know, would, would be very hard on the as if model, you know, whereas others like, um, you know, like I quote, you know, the kind of anarchist anthropologist who unfortunately passed away uh, last year, David Graeber, who's, who's, who kind of feels like you know most of all the action is in the as if acting as if space and it reminds me i guess of writing only because um again with this boel quote about there's like there's cops in the head and then there's the headquarters and when you're writing you know you're kind of you know that you're not you know that there's all kinds of um cops and you know in, in the head and you know that they're outside the head but you're also trying to create a space as if you could explore what you wanted to explore um and i mean and again it's and then it's like when you and then when when it when it comes out and you go around it's kind of as if everyone's trying to discipline you into all the ways you weren't free when you wrote it but there's something about doing it that has to preserve a space no matter how phantasmagorical you, I mean, you mentioned the, the the section in the novel where um, it kind of deviates into the story of a of a of a teenager in the nineteen eighties who's who grows up in in East Berlin and is a teenage punk who becomes the object of Stasi's surveillance and then and then she becomes you know she's forced into being an, an informant. You know, I I I wrote that partly because I was interested in this difference between you know a, a kind of twentieth century totalitarianism. Mm -hmm. And the sort of mechanisms that are around for for us in say in the US mm -hmm. now, where a lot of it is happening at least formally with our ascent. Mm -hmm. But then I, later on for a podcast, I went back and and actually sought out one of the very first mm -hmm. punks in in East Germany who was a a sixteen year old at the time mm -hmm. who just saw he saw a picture. He wasn't even really sort of certain about the music but he just saw a picture of the sex pistols mm -hmm. and he decided that looked great and so he's got he spiked his hair up with soap and tore some his clothes and Alf, alfie walked out of the door and into a world of trouble because the 
the the Stasi were fairly convinced that punk was some sort of CIA backed plot mm -hmm. to undermine the morals of the of the uh, you know the the workers and peasants state. Um, and so he said, you know, he would he would basically just go down to Alexander Platz and hang out with other teenagers who were dressed like that, and they. They, you know, they would manage to get hold of some of the music people were bringing in tapes or whatever. And and it was, you know, they were just doing the things that teenagers do. But because of this, this right. assumption by the, the Stasi that there was something behind it, they were, he was picked up almost every day and, and interrogated. And he developed a relationship with, mm -hmm. with his Stasi interrogator. Mm -hmm. Um, who would kind of ask him things, that, you know, just trying to try and work out if he was being fed particular political views so he said well what do you know about anarchism and and this 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 guy would, would say nothing but then he'd go and look it up so effectively he was being educated but the point of, of 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 bringing him up is to is to say that i asked him about well what do you make of the present day what do you make of cell phone surveillance you know you, we don't live under totalitarianism anymore and i was expecting him to to rail against uh against the abrogations of of yeah. freedom that there are and he was absolutely firmly uh, he said mm. you must live as if you are free and mm. that's the first thing and then you you go forward mm -hmm. into the world behave as if you're free and take mm. it from there you know if you worry so much that you you don't act at all then they've already won mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. i i see limits to that but at the same time i think existentially that has to be that has to be the way that you make that space for yourself mm -hmm. yeah that makes a lot of sense to me and I mean given that the as if feeling is uh in some ways I mean it's a feeling right so like so it's not a um you know as Rem would say it's not a demonstrable fact about freedom you know she wants like the facts about freedom not like a feeling right but I think I mean one thing I found really interesting is that in certain interviews I've read with you like at some points I've read you I, I think correctly and kind of hilariously talking about liberals obsession with feelings and as opposed to like certain forms of structural change um, but then on the other hand, you know, certainly like the experience of reading Red Pill is certainly a, a it's it, it's a journey through, um, you know, the emotional life of our of our narrator. And obviously that's something that novels excel at and yours in particular. And I guess I just wanted to talk for a minute about 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 the role of feeling in the novel, because while I think you've said, and I think I, I, I get this too about the narrator that, you know, that he is kind of having a crisis of self, like that the self seems to evanesce when, when he looks for it, he certainly has a lot of affective feeling, you know, as he kind of goes through um, and this meltdown. And um, yeah, I mean, I guess that's just my first question is that do you think of an, uh, compared to the things that you have thought or felt about an overemphasis on feeling, say, in a political sphere, do you think of the novel as something different? Um, I mean, I think I suppose the first thing to say about about feeling in the political sphere sphere is I'm I'm very I, I sort of specifically mean feelings of guilt and innocence. Gotcha. Um, okay, that's very helpful. And yeah. I think, yeah. And I think I think it's very it, it, it there's there's a very kind of well worn, let's call it a liberal route through through the political to 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 say you know how can i absolve myself of my feelings of guilt about mm -hmm. my structural position mm -hmm. in this right. in this situation you know mm -hmm. like oh, oh no oh, i you know i have mm -hmm. i have wealth and you know whatever it whatever it would be and and that's that's the thing that i wish to disrupt because mm -hmm. i think i think you know the attempt to um, to be innocent or to feel innocent or mm -hmm. to uh kind of you know untangle yourselves from the implications of your structural position i, th I think leads people off into some uh, some very sort of strange mm -hmm. unhelpful politics mm -hmm. and it seems to me much better to look sort of objectively in in this you know to use marxist language about about your structural position about your your uh your class position and so on there are things that you can tell about uh, uh, about what what's going to work and what's not going to work um 
that said, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with feeling per se. I mean, you know, I mean, that feeling is part of human flourishing. I mean, is there's, uh, you know, I'm certainly not interested in some sort of cold objectivity or some sort of unlocated, mm -hmm. positionless experience mm -hmm. of the world. But then we you know, get into what, you know, what is it to write a novel? I mean, and, mm -hmm. you know, it's, 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 you know, oldest observation in the in the book to say that the novel is a bourgeois form because the novel the novel tent deals with with individuals and roots these uh, mm -hmm. roots its questions and its ways of understanding the world through making characters. You know, I mean, and mm -hmm. uh, I suppose I square that circle slightly by by thinking of myself as a systems novelist, maybe mm -hmm. as someone who tries to to mm -hmm. see their characters. Uh, as, as sort of imbricated in these larger mm -hmm. social, economic, mm -hmm. technological systems and mm -hmm. to try and kind of make those things visible through telling stories. I mean, I think that is a thing the novel can do. And I think that's a, I can, you know, I have a kind of case that I make for the novel or based on, on, on that. To get to the, you know, the, yep. the guy in Red Pill, the narrator of, yeah. of Red Pill is, is sort of, you know, I mean, he's, he's, uh he allows me to have some fun with somebody who's who's close enough to me uh for me to be able to work some things through but also as far as far enough away that i can i can mock him for some of his pretensions mm -hmm. you know he's uh uh he's he's irredeemably individualist like mm -hmm. he kind of the one of the main you know he goes through this whole crisis uh a crisis of selfhood a crisis of politics in the book never once does he really think of trying to kind of reach out and make community or solidarity with others this is all this is all this quite kind of uh, um it's all rooted through his sense of himself and his you know but eventually his sense that he is dissolving and and that becomes a, a kind of a mental break mm -hmm. but you know he's never he you know he he never thinks hang on my solution for my feelings of fear and and, and isolation will be to try and make meaning with other people or to make mm -hmm. to make a you know to make community with other with other people so he's you know he's a bourge to the to the absolute you know end in 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 the book and um and he moves in these these fairly sort of well heeled Brooklyn uh, mm -hmm. intellectual circles, and you know it's it's no real spoiler to say that you know the book ends on election night in twenty sixteen, and it's a milieu in which, firstly, the Trump uh, victory comes as a as a sort of terrible surprise, as a as a shock mm -hmm. rather than as a as a product of processes mm -hmm. that have been going on for decades, and secondly. Uh, is experienced as a as a kind of you know as 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 a as a sort of crisis of of the of selfhood in that it's a crisis of the kinds of meanings that this group of people the narrator in particular have have a I mean it's their picture of the world that's been disrupted I mean I th I think that the, the sort of libidinal energies that were released by that. Mm -hmm. You know the uh, and the, and the 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 source of the glee for some of the kind of frog Twitter Trumpist mm -hmm. types, uh, you know, who are all passing around pictures of mm -hmm. liberal ladies crying, um, was this kind of the the, ex the experience of 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 this break of this kind of rupture of a of a of a quite complacent set of norms and my experience of the last years has been of gradually watching this kind of thing coming from the outside i mean and i you know i don't claim to have, have predicted quite how dominant it would become in mainstream american politics i was surprised that the the the, the world of the chans mm -hmm. turned out to to be able to to elect a president mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. to the extent that they did i mean you can mm -hmm. you know argue about yeah. that but i had had this sense that this was out there that this was coming and that i didn't see it reflected in the kind of discourse that uh uh was was sort of being conducted in the sort of more rarefied echelons of the of the media and so that was another reason to write the book to kind of to 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 to, to write about about somebody who undergoes a shock who undergoes a kind of uh 
crisis of an, epi an epistemic crisis, I suppose, mm -hmm. a, a, a crisis of the structures of, of meaning that he, he lives inside. I mean, one thing I like about the end, and I hope we're not giving too much away, but is like, I mean, whatever, you just gave it whatever there is to give away, but like, I mean, Trump got elected, we know that. <laughs> so, but like, <laughs> but the narrator, like on the one hand, he has this kind of, no matter how debilitated he's become, there's a sense in which, you know, that, that he could be feeling at the end his own sense of mastery, like like his own sense of like, like Trump's election was the, the red pill to his wife and her circle of people, right? Except for that, the, except for that, I wouldn't still choose him as like my Sherpa, you know, to like the next, <laughs> you know? So it's like, he he's not gonna, he might be feeling like I told you so, but we're not feeling like his I told you so is necessarily fruitful, you know, either. Absolutely, yeah. The fact the fact that he 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 feels that he saw something coming and they didn't doesn't change the fact that it's coming and he has no he still has no resources to to combat it or deal with it. I mean the um I mean one or two people on online who don't credit me with self consciousness have have said what a terrible book it is because it's just a resistance novel. It's like it kind of <laughs> exemplifies yeah. the Mm -hmm. you know elite liberal hand wringing mm -hmm. and that's partly i mean that's that's pr partly what i wanted to portray mm -hmm. in in that that you know that it's this particularly individualist character you know mm -hmm. he can't you know he's he's uh uh almost kind of congenitally incapable of mm -hmm. of, of collaborating or, or or being in community with with people I mean, and what do you know? What do you do when the act, you know, the only way to kind of make political power is is to form alliances and to make to make political blocks. I mean, it's a kind of set of habits that you saw people trying to kind of acquire in real time. You know, lots of people who'd never really been attending political meetings or were kind of we're trying to work out how to, you know, it's like it was like kind of mm -hmm. scrambling to 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 make the structures that would have needed to be in place long long before if the if the danger was to be warded off and it seems like i mean i i agree with you and i understand what you're saying about his congenital incapacity to move towards community or solidarity but it also seems like my read was also uh that um uh, that, that it wasn't just like bourgeois individualism it was it was particularly also i mean that but filtered through a kind of homosocial obsessional mindset whereby first with Edgar this annoying guy at the um writing retreat but then later obviously with Anton you know that that that, it, that, that, that the structure, which is kind of cathexis onto like a male who in some ways seems to challenge, threaten, you know, whatever it is to you remains the, the principal cathexis. And that just when you're thinking that he has identified that this show and the things that Anton is doing is kind of mainstreaming alt-right stuff into, you know, kind of laundering them through Hollywood, you know, his big answer is to go be like a crank at Anton's Q and A's, you know, and you're just thinking, oh God, like, no, <laughs> you know, not that, but partly not that, not because it's like not politically constructive, whatever that can all be argued. It's more like not that because it's, it just felt like a further doubling down on, 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 on male competition, I guess. You know? Absolutely. I mean, you know, this is, it's, 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 hard one but it's it's you know i have come to understand that <laughs> that um uh yeah, i mean and very much how i was socialized as a as a as a teenager in order to do you know that it, it is about you know you setting yourself up in competition against an antagonist and another yeah. another man and and um the kind of absurdity and impotence of 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 that is is also is also precisely there i mean there's a i i mean i can't i can't quite remember it might even have been a slavoj zizek thing saying that there's a kind of there's always a sort of moment of political breakdown in the in the narrative of like say hollywood films where a question becomes so kind of complex to face that that it just can't be dealt with within the narrative economy of the film. So they have a fist fight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and, you know, that's that's the point where, you know, certain things become impossible to deal with within the form. And and 
and yeah, and, and precisely that. And in, in, in this in this novel, there is he's faced with these very very large questions and a set of of kind of realizations that um, would require him to to move beyond this. But instead, as you say, he kind of falls back into you know who is actually smarter. Right. You know, I mean, that's and, and and that that kind of. You know, it's 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 in a it's in a way it's it's, it's a bit like kind of conspiracy theories. I've written a bit about conspiracy mm -hmm. theories recently, and mm -hmm. and the conspiracy theories are simplifications. Yeah, they're they're ways of understanding very complicated, slippery processes mm -hmm. that imagine that that there are just ten guys in a boardroom, mm -hmm. and that if you kind of kick down the door and you know took them into custody the world would be saved and would be a better place and and that's naive because it clearly that's not how power mm -hmm. works and how mm -hmm. you know we don't have these satisfying resolutions and so that's this is sort of another another theme of that book is mm -hmm. the is the you know is the way that and obviously that the character falls short and the way that any personalized look for, mm -hmm. for villains will will fall short you know i mean Trump is just the face that that thing wears right now. Trump, you know, in himself is fairly trivial. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I have one more question about Q and conspiracy theories, and then maybe I'll ask you a couple of questions about writing, and then we can ask other people to jump in. But my, so my question, so I, I, I really like the piece in Harper's about, is that, if that, is that what you're talking about, yeah, about conspiracy yeah. theories in Q? And I, you know, I was thinking, I mean, you could summarize that better than I can, but I was just, you know, for the people listening, you know, what you just described is that it seemed like you were, you know, trying to emphasize a difference, at least at the start of the essay, between the conspiracy theories of yesteryear, which which did offer grand and simplifying explanations, like the 10 guys at the boardroom, but that Q offers a kind of fractalizing web that the more you are led into it, that it can even, it actually can have a kind of overwhelming, even terrifying complexity and you write that with Q what starts off as heroic fantasy ends up as horror. And this was super interesting and I just wondered if you had watched the documentary recently about Q and if you had what were your thoughts and then secondly something that I didn't watch it but something that bothered me just as I was looking at the kind of aftermath of people talking about Ron Watkins and whatever maybe we're already too in the weeds for some of the people here but if we're not you know, I saw a lot of people saying like, oh, I wonder how everyone feels that they got owned by like a man child pig farmer in the Philippines or something. And I was like, just kind of like you're saying with the face of it, I was like, that scarcely is the point. I mean, like any shepherd of libidinal energies, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter wh where they are, what their face is. I don't know, like, but it almost was as if the reaction to that, to me, sounded like an almost like a nostalgia for conspiracy theories of yesteryear as if like if there were an Oz everyone would see the Oz and say oh my god I was had but that doesn't seem to be what's happening at all you know? yeah it's like it's like the kind of the Kennedy assassination is is the Reagan to accuse Trump isn't it uh -huh. it's, it's, it's <laughs> the kind of uh, you know we feel sort of faintly nostalgic for 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 it but I mean I I th I think I didn't actually see the documentary, but I've I've spent way too much time in 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 this zone. So you know, for people who don't know, the it, it seems that father and son pornography team, Jim and Ron Watkins, based out of the Philippines, had control of the account on Aitken that that was doing the Q drops, and it's likely that Ron, the son, was kind of on a day to day level at least latterly the person who was who was was controlling the account and um you know they drove a lot of traffic to their site through that and blah 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 um and as you say like the kind of focus on him as an individual it seems to domesticate this thing in an unhelpful way because he's neither here nor there i mean he's you know if it wasn't him it would have been someone else it's just I mean, the, the part of it that interests me particularly is the way the Q thing kind of emerged in the earlier days on the chance. It was um, it was a sort of accepted, it's almost like a kind of literary form uh, of post, uh, you know, uh, uh, like people have always written these little kind of almost like kind of in character posts on on the on these chan sites. And there was a, you know, there was a kind of sort of accepted format where someone would say, hey, I'm a super insider in place X and let me tell you it's all going to go down and, and you'll know because of uh, of this. And 
even the whoever was controlling the Q account in the beginning was making the, these kind of posts that seemed to have they, they, there was a genre of them that was a type of post that one made and for whatever reason finally one of those things got traction mm -hmm. and then it, it you know it sort of jumped the species barrier out of the chan world into boomer youtube world which was when it really took took mm -hmm. hold and, and and i spent a certain amount of time watching people's youtube channels when there was a drop and it was an it was an experience of community for people. It was a kind of community. It was very much like the sort of slightly um, crackpot numerological Bible exegesis that people people will do in a lot of places. People would come on some of these channel, and everybody would have good ideas about what the drop meant. And you know, somebody you know, people have status and authority because they can interpret particularly well or make particularly baroque stories around it. But you could see that it was a lot of people who were finding a, a kind of a shape to their lives. And it's I mean, it was a very attractive thing to think that you're a warrior for for children, for saving children, for, for a sort of deeper truth. And it was a very you can see why people got so enmeshed in it. And, you know, and I hope people are looking now on the sort of downward slope of this thing as the, you know, the storm didn't happen. Mm -hmm. and the 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 narrative is quite hard to maintain there are people still people are saying you know trump is playing you know 16 dimensional chess and you know and soon the arrests will will take place but by and large people are it, it's diffusing now and becoming more inchoate and kind of falling back into the sort of soup of references out of which it came i mean the the web-like quality of it is fascinating in that it sort of expanded to take in everything from Atlantis to to Area Fifty One to Kennedy to all you know all the things the, the the Illuminati everything that's been around in that part of uh that part of existence. I mean, I I think in the the Harper's piece I called it folk scholarship or folk you know folk research mm -hmm. and. This I if the figure of the researcher, the the you know the person with an internet connection who can kind of go forth and sift through the, uh, the complexities and pull out truth is a is a, I think you know one of the sort of dominant figures of our time and relates back to older mm -hmm. things, but it's really important now. Mm -hmm. So is it, you know, it's, it's, it's becoming less organized. It's become, but those energies are still there. The desire for meaning is still there. The feeling that, uh, that, uh, good people are, are, are down and bad people are up is, is, is still there. Um, the suspicion of elites and so on. I mean, and, and there's no reason to imagine that, that it will not coalesce again in some form presumably in a very very unexpected unlikely form i mean no, nobody would have predicted that, that would be a narrative that could that could gather such cultural momentum i mean especially internationally there's a lot of queue in japan and germany and oh. places that are not uh, -huh. uh not very kind of connected with the american po politics that's super interesting and it's so interesting. I want to ask you one more political question before I ask you a couple questions about writing, but that's just because you're here and so I don't want to miss my chance, which is that, um, so in thinking about what you've described just, just now and then other times about this kind of libidinal, you know, channel um, that has been opened and um, in, you know, in, in my own forthcoming book, I have spent a bit, a bit of time with uh, political theorist Wendy Brown, who I think has been very, uh, she's just been very excellent on describing what she calls the brilliant campaign of the alt-right to associate um, anti-egalitarian, anti-immigrant, and anti-responsibility sentiments with freedom and fun, while casting left and liberal commitments as repressive, regulatory, grim, and policing. And her concern is that uh, that this that this campaign seduces its would-be converts with a feeling of release from responsibilities of all kinds and, and a feeling of disinhibition. And then she says that the fusion of that libidinal freedom and fun with an authoritarian statism, she says, has a formidable power to um, appeal to the young, the immature, the reckless, and the wounded. Um, 
And then her warning is this fusion will land us in more trouble than we knew and requires that we think very hard about what strategies would most successfully counter it. Um, I'm not doing that interview thing where you're like, well, Hari, what are the strategies? But I just, <laughs> I mean, I, that's stupid, but I just wonder, but, but, but I, maybe because it is a fool's errand, but I, but I have spent time trying to imagine those strategies and I wonder what if you have any thoughts um, I mean I, I think they I think they've emerged I think you know I think I think the news on that front is it's good I mean first I completely recognize that that char characterization and you know we you know we've Hillary is mom and and the boys you know the boys are kind of going like ah, mom that it's it's it, those those kind of things were were very were very sort of straightforwardly visible but I think the trans transition in far right culture it has been it's been a cultural tra transition and there's been a kind of um you know the far right of my youth were were joyless skinheads um you know parroting kind of rather sort of tedious propaganda points that were sort of stale in the 1960s but suddenly the discovery of irony, I think, and the discovery of, of humor and playfulness that came out of the Chan culture, that came out of the sort of, there was sort of arms race of grossness that uh, was a sort of feature of the Chan culture. I mean, I was spending time on the Chans kind of as an appalled observer, right, I should say, rather than a kind of enthusiastic participant. But I was lurking around on these sites in the early aughts and seeing this kind of arms race quality and, the, and and seeing a lot of like racist and misogynistic material being presented as as a sort of uh you know how gross can i be like how shocking can i be now and what then happened is that the you know the the suburban teens who were sort of driving this the high school boys kind of for one reason or another got fused with a much more sort of serious group of, of far right activists. I mean, I, I mean, um, there's a very good book by Dale Barron about uh, about 4chan and its rise. And he suggests that that, that what happened is that the, for the, the Chans raided a site called Stormfront, uh, a, a Nazi, near Nazi site. Mm -hmm. And that the the near Nazis were kind of intrigued to discover that there was this kind of uh, breeding ground and then made active attempts to recruit so you know you cut to 15 years later mm -hmm. the kids have all grown up the irony has fallen away and the, and people are asserting um you know i mean extreme biological racism for example as a as a you know a serious position but it's all packaged with this plausible deniability you know the 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 thing about the the okay uh symbol you know every you know every liberal who hand rings and says that's a nazi sign you can say you're just you know you've lost it you know it's it's i'm just saying okay and that exists that that space of joking not joking serious not serious is the space in which this has has grown up but it was very successful as as wendy brown said in that quote the the presentation of 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 uh the opposing position is essentially censorious and authoritarian and kind of clamping down on on the irrepressible libidinal energies that you want to be free and you know and also that there's i think there's something going on with kind of male groups and you know that you can kind of point yeah, backwards <laughs> into, into sort of you know more traditionally fascist formations i mean you look at something yeah. like the proud boys gradually kind of looking more and more like the the sort of Nazi SR mm -hmm. by the mm -hmm. by the month, mm -hmm. but they're not they are not the they're not the only part of people who can be funny on the internet. You know they say you know commies don't know how to meme, but actually it turns out that they sort of do. I mean, and you think of things like the emergence of gritty that hockey sim is it Philadelphia hockey symbol gritty the sort of uh as a as a sort of meme figure from from the left, and then there's a lot of very successful um trolling and outing of people and and forcing people into the open i mean if the if the this the the space of action for a lot of these people is is anonymity and deniability you know 
basically there's been a very sort of a concerted anti-fascist campaign to kind of put these people's actual beliefs and identities in front of their employers in front of in front of other kind of public spaces and to say well is that acceptable or not yes no forcing people into mm -hmm. into actually either siding with it or not and reducing that sort of oh i was just joking i was just being ironic mm -hmm. space so mm -hmm. i think those you know it, there's a sort of online war that's been going on for for years and is you know is, is down and dirty and being conducted with just with sort of viciousness on both sides and in a kind of sort of larger sort of kinds of public discourse, you know, I, I think, um, you know, the left is learning to be a bit, uh, a, a, a bit less easily baited, you know, the out the ba baiting into outrage is, is an old, is an old tactic and it's kind of becoming, you know, it's become clear over the last five years or so how, ineffective that is and how that just you know certain sorts of moral panic and certain sorts of outrage just mm -hmm. serve the mm -hmm. the uh, outright agenda mm -hmm. be able to eye roll and not take them seriously when they wish you to take them seriously is right. a good sort of judo move in that mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. uh in that fight mm -hmm. that's super interesting um, all right, well, I have all these questions about form and stuff that we're not going to get to. So I'll just ask one question about writing and then we can open it up. But I just, I read in an interview that you said that some of the best advice you'd ever gotten about writing was uh, like this feeling it will pass, you know? And uh, what, what made me laugh about that was that when people ask me the same question, I often know something that a mentor of mine once told me, which was a variation on the theme saying that my feelings about the work, my work didn't matter the work was what mattered but that my feelings would change day by day but whether or not and that but now this is true I think and I think this is very to me that's been very very useful however I also asked somebody different at some point like I asked a friend if I'm writing something and I feel really bored while I'm writing it like does that mean it's boring and they were like yeah <laughs> like it does and that was also really worrisome to me because I so I'm just wondering about like when you're working and this notion of a why is this feeling it will pass why is it some of the best advice and then b you know how do you chart judging what you're doing based on how you're feeling about it or how you feel while you're working i mean it's, it's the difference between the fleeting feeling and a consistent feeling. right a consistent this is bad <laughs> i mean i sit down and, and and read what i did yesterday and i think you know you're a fool and an, an adult and you should do another job and and then um you know, um, and, and then an occasion I sit down and think, well, that was quite smart, actually. <laughs> um, and and neither sh neither should be trusted in a straightforward way. But if you have a if you have a, if you sit down every day and you are bored by your project, well, maybe that is a that is a sign that certainly there's a sign that you should you know you should find another way of approaching the project, if not junking the project altogether. Mm -hmm. um, but. I mean, I think it's one of the hardest parts of writing is kind of learning, you know, you're, you're, you're using your, your own reactions in such a kind of finely tuned way to judge the choices that you're making. And, you know, there are days when we're off and there are days when, you know, I mean, it's, it, it's why it's not a good idea to press send on the, on the essay as soon as you finished it, you know, you, you let it, you let it sit. I mean, I, I find one of the most useful tools I have when writing a long form thing is is to is to put it away and then come back to it when I've slightly forgotten what it was like reading it certainly like a draft of a novel mm -hmm. if I I often often how many times do I have a fresh draft of a novel in the in the times it's when I have a bunch a, of novels so <laughs> <laughs> but a good a good tactic for me is to kind of go away do something else for a few weeks then print this thing out and take it to a cafe or to some place where I don't write and then just read it as if I'm a person reading a, a a book in a in a cafe and like alienating myself from the thing and often I discover things about the rhythm all that kind of wood for the trees stuff that's impossible to 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 get to when you know when you're in the midst of a project that's when that's when I'm like oh right it reads like that it flows like that or there's clearly I failed to explain that or whatever it would be that's that's when I can just dis I discover a lot of a lot of uh things that can be fixed that I hadn't kind of understood before 
Yeah, I'm definitely a big fan of the self alienation factor. I mean, sometimes I almost joke with myself, like I'll put on a kind of like, um, you know, like I'll actually be almost play acting like, oh, what is this thing? <laughs> that I found, oh, it appears to be a piece of writing. Let me see. Well, yeah, exactly. Who could have done this? But like the more I can do that, the better I feel like the read is of the work. But anyway, David, I don't know if you want to step in and have some questions for Hari from, from the people who are here, many of whom, like I say, I know are very discerning people. Yeah, I, I, I'm gonna I jump in. Actually, before we do that, I just want to follow up with both of you about that, Maggie, because one of my favorite pieces of sort of writing advice, which I think comes from the Argonauts, is about how you're, you're reticent on the first draft. You're not as bold on the page as you are in life in the first draft. And then in revision, you make it sharper and bolder so that you actually kind of enact a, a boldness that isn't necessarily yours in, 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 in how you carry yourself. So that, that question of being more authentic on the page. And I wonder if you both can kind of address that question. And then while they're addressing that question, we have about 20 minutes left. So anyone in the audience who has a question, either use your little virtual raise hand thing and, or just simply put a question in the chat and we'll share them. Um, anyway, so. Um, I mean, I certainly, I certainly think that, yeah, re revision for me is often, is often a process of, 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 you know, of, of admitting that that's what I want to say and then saying it in a straightforward way rather than with five different images or five different kind of parallel clauses, just kind of striking them all out and saying like, that's actually, you know, what I want to say and I'm going to stand behind it. Yeah, I would just totally underscore that, which is that I think, and actually this relates a little bit to our more political conversation about libidinal, um, uh, you know, output or is that I think we have this idea that we're all like a cauldron of things that are just, you know, transgressive and impermissible to say when in fact most of our immediate, you know, output is just full of like these interminable clauses and the unsureness and the kind of like cops in the head and the like, you know, for myself, like academic obfuscations. And it's like, it's only after, you know, like taking like the whole page and often, often I find that like, I'll just kind of put like a circle around like the subject verb object in the middle of it. And I'm like, okay, that's what I wanted to say, you know, and then, you know, I once had a, a, a um, a mentor, the same person who told me about the feelings, actually Wayne Kustenbaum, whom I adore, but Wayne told me once also that I could, I should say the impermissible thing and then I could spend the rest of my essay running away from it. But if I never <laughs> said it, then I would never have, then I would never, so that, that I also think that too. But, but the last thing I'll say is I think this links actually also to the question of the boring, which is that, you know, the problem with writing is that writing all that boring not alive stuff is also like a burning off process, you know? So it's like, you if you don't ever do it, this idea that you could just get the needle in the vein is not gonna allow you to burn off, you know, defensiveness, obfuscation, unclarity, like you're not gonna, you, you won't find the vein. So you have to kind of, you've got to dick around for a while, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's so true. Yeah and bore yourself and then you find out that you're bored and then you're like why am i so bored and that's all can be part of it you know so it's the experience or i don't want to say that writing is performative because that's overstated but it's it's the experience of being in the moment with the writing and kind of living with the writing as you're producing it rather than kind of imagining what the writing is going to be when the glorious end you know that, it, that you're that you're driving towards yeah uh we have uh claire you have your hand up you want to um un unmute and, and ask away Sure. Um, thanks. This has a, a been a real a uh, real treat. I think the boon of the pandemic for me is getting to see authors I wouldn't necessarily otherwise get to see. So thank you both for this. Um, uh, Red Pill was one of my favorite books of the pandemic reading so far. Um, and I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about um, kind of how you situated it in mental health narratives. I think the politics is super fascinating, but for me, a lot of what I uh, experienced in there was kind of that mental health crisis and that move from seeming sanity to a different place and then back to a kind of neutral zone. I mean, one of the things that I wanted to write about was what happens after, after this, you know, I mean, I, I, I mean, as a, as a, as a younger man, I was interested in these, these kind of towering moments of, 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 of sort of dissolution or, or, or kind of grandeur or whatever it would be. And, but what I wanted to do, the, the, I mean, it is a, it's a book about somebody who's who's trying to get back to his 
life to the to the to the person he loves and to his child and and i wanted to uh, to to try and think about what how how you would rebuild trust and how you would um would kind of attempt to remake domesticity after you had had trashed it in such a such an extreme way and um and that that kind of sense of kind of crampedness that he has that he's you know of 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 knowing that he's you know he has so much to to prove and 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 not and and the the difficulties of of being seen as somebody who's not trustworthy uh were were very much kind of where i wanted to leave it i didn't want to kind of leave him on a mountain top kind of you know romantic you know the, it's i mean it's funny that we i i wanted this Caspar David Friedrich uh, picture the traveler on the sea of fog to be to be the cover partly because it is such a uh, a cliche of exactly that kind of a man alone with his you know towering thoughts kind of uh, of, of narrative and, and I mean the designer was was terrified at the idea of that because he said you know how many books have this on the cover and I was like well yes exactly and so we found a way to to displace it and obscure it with this with this shape which i you know I, I really liked but but yeah it's it's it it, it 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 i didn't want to make it a kind of literary crisis i wanted to make this a real sort of lived crisis for a for a a, a, a person that would have who would have to pick up the pieces afterwards yeah. uh we have another hand up uh minar yeah hi thank you so much for uh for sharing with us today I had a question um, about uh, working productively with the affect of shame, which I've read uh, a little bit, Maggie, uh, in an exchange with Moira Davey, uh, talk at length about this. And I just wanted uh, to hear more about uh, her thoughts on shame and working productively with it and the power uh, reversal that happens um, I guess when we are the, the, the writer, uh, as the writer and the the power that happens with the different forms of writing. So um, let's say as an academic versus um, writing fiction or auto fiction um, and how, um, yeah, how she deals productively or not with um, this power reversal or how, how aware or not uh, she is of of this power reversal and then of the, the authority that the voice also that she writes with has. Um, so, um, yeah, those are, I guess, my question for you. Okay, um, I think Maggie, that was directed at you if you wanna take it and then Hari, if you wanna, if you have any thoughts on that, by all means, please feel free to jump in. Minar, was the she in your question Moira or me or somebody else? I just got a little bit lost at the end. Sorry, uh, what was what the you she say? in your question? Moira Davy or was it me or was it somebody? Or when you were, uh, uh, I just was uh, when you were saying how she feels about this or how she feels about that. I just wasn't sure who the she was. Oh, um, sorry. Yeah, I I think I was talking about like the exchange in this exchange, how both which, of you were exchange? considering, oh, me and were Morgan. considering this. Yes. Gotcha. Yes. Um, I think that I, I think that she's, I can't remember what it was for, maybe art forum a number of years ago, I did a conversation with uh, Moira Davey, who's a really great artist and writer that you guys should uh, know about, D-A-V-E-Y, if you don't already. Um, you know, I mean, in that conversation, I think if I remember correctly, Moira was occupying the kind of shame, shame place. And I was talking more about a kind of post shame type of writing or something. But I, so I think she would be better to speak to shame than I, but I would say that, um, uh, so Sylvan Tompkins, who uh, is a psychologist who, um, Eve Sedgwick, a queer theorist, kind of uh, injected into a more uh, uh, main, mainstream theoretical milieu. Tompkins talks about pairs of affects and the affect that he pairs with shame is interest. 
the, the interest and shame are like the opposites. And so to be very interested in something, it makes you available or vulnerable to being, to feeling shame, you know? And I, to me, this is very useful because I don't tend to think about shame as like, in a kind of Foucauldian sense of like the secret of yourself is the secret of your sex or something like that. I tend to think of it as more like, you know, to have an, uh, to, to, to admit an activated interest in something as a vulnerable making activity and what else is writing, but writing is to, is an expression of interest and of showing the world what you care about. And for me, that's why any kind of writing, like people often talk to me as if like personal writing is shameful, but to me, it's the activity of interest. It's not the content that, 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 that is the thing to struggle with. And I think that that's, you know, I think that that's as it should be, because if you're not putting anything on the line or you're not feeling um, some sense of something mattering and all of the possible vulnerability that goes with that, then you're not working probably at the spot that's, that's the most important for you. Uh, I think that's a, such a yeah that's such a useful formulation. I think is shame and, and interest. Uh, yeah, I sometimes say to people that I think I think you know there should be something at risk for the writer in in a piece of writing, and I think that's what I that's what I mean by that. That the risk is is shame and exposure or or, or vulner, vulnerability rather than other 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 forms of risk necessarily. But yeah, showing that you care showing that you care enough to to make this thing and to go and 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 put it forth into uh into the public sphere is 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 a is a potentially shaming you know as a, it's to risk shame and and uh, and and that's uh you know i suppose you only have to then kind of go on to your review sites or whatever i mean if you if you want to sort of indulge in self-hatred as a writer there are good reads is there for you in order to in order to let you kind of really beat yourself up um and uh in and there's a kind of uh cost to i don't know i mean it seems that in order to be able to maintain yourself as a writer you have to also be be able to kind of you know walk through the marketplace with everybody throwing dirt at you in your in your sort of sackcloth and ashes it's like I have to unmute myself because I'm laughing so hard, but maybe you don't, maybe you might feel ashamed if you don't know how accompanied you are. So I will laugh, I will laugh with you. <laughs> I've written down, walk through the marketplace with mud thrown at you and Goodreads equals indulge in your self-hatred as a writer. So these are the tips I'm taking away from very good tips. <laughs> I, I think I think Goodreads and Amazon reviews are, you know, <laughs> the best ego deflation tool in the history of ego deflation tools. They're also amazing <laughs> because they're like a they're also like an inflated version, like a comedic inflated version of like, you know, like your most you know, like 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 it's not like somebody's making something up entirely. It's just like a kind of Macy's balloon parade version of you, like walking down the street. You know? right. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, nothing my mum could ever come up with is as, as, <laughs> as, as terrible as I mean. There's a whole sort of genre. <laughs> you owe me twenty dollars. It's, the, right. it's the right. I read the first ten pages and put it down, so you owe me the rest. Yeah. Yeah, my favorite. And I think Hari, you were referring to something along these lines early in terms of emails. Is when. You get the uh, the comment that's trashing your book for doing exactly what you sort of wanted it to do. You know, it's like, oh, well, I guess that was a success then, even if it's not coming across. Yeah, um, my, my favorite online review of of Red Pill so far has been has been it doesn't even mention NAFTA. <laughs> 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 so you know where to start for the next one. I actually want to jump in with a quick question for you, Hari, since you were talking about risk, that question of risk, which I think is really essential. Um, but I wonder, since you are, I mean, you're primarily a novelist, but also an essayist, nonfiction writer, um, commentator, I wonder, is that sense or quality of risk different for you in the essay form than it is in the, in the novel form? I mean, I mean, it's, it's a different, it's a different sort of utterance sort of obviously, isn't it, isn't it? I mean, you know, I, I, I think the, the game with an essay is to, is to not say anything that you wouldn't, you wouldn't wish to defend in, in debate. <laughs> um, but the, but a novel, I mean, in novel often what I'm doing is trying to kind of stage something very uneasy or to kind of make it exist in a in a in an unresolved place rather than i mean i you know i i don't want to kind of have characters that are just sort of you know carrying these backpacks of 
of of points of view around with them and 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 are just sort of there as vehicles to stage uh some sort of uh, debate which i already have an opinion on i mean i'm i'm interested in in something much more kind of it's like going going to the difficult place going to the bad place in 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 a way um and that has the risk of that is obviously uh, being deemed by readers to 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 believe something or to kind of hold some sort of point of view you know if you're uh um i mean things like depiction of racism for it for for example i mean I, I know i have a lot of white friends who are writers who would find it very very hard right now to to stage things like that because of because of the the question of what what's what's deemed to be you know the writer's own point of view and and there's a, there's another kind of complicated question about what are people's libidinal investments in staging things so you know if you have a you know if you why why do you want to write a 20 page rape scene you know what what's in that for you there's that's another another thing but um where am I going with this? But yeah, I, 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 I certainly think there's there's value in in using your chops, whatever such as they are, to kind of push out into into areas that that are uncomfortable and are complicated. Because otherwise, why would you bother with the furniture of a narrative? Why, if you have a if you have a clearly articulated point of view, that's that's an that's an essay. Right. Sorry, I was muted. I, I, I've got gardeners and barking dogs on this end. So, <laughs> well, I think that that's actually a great place for us to kind of end this conversation. And I think it's a great place for us to end the series just on that, that question of risk and, 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 um, and responsibility and the kind of porousness in some way of those ideas. Um, so I want to thank, um, first of all, I want to thank uh, Hari Kunzru for being here and, and for and for this brilliant conversation. And Maggie Nelson also, this is just, um, I, I've still got many hours of work today, but this is definitely the highlight of the day for me. Um, and I wanna thank um, my co-curator, Emily Anderson. I wanna thank um, the Levin Institute for allowing us to put on um, this series. And I wanna thank all of you for coming both today and also throughout the series, the, the, um, the, the the performance. The interview has been recorded um, and will be available for people to uh, to see. We'll also um, be publishing a version of it on uh, on Airlight over the um, in the spring, later in the spring. And um, I think that's that. That's it. Thank you all so much. This has been really, really yeah, wonderful. Becky, thank you for taking the time to do this. It's really, it was really. It great. was a total pleasure. I presume this will not be the last time that we talk. So I look forward yeah, to the next I time. We'll do it again soon. Me too. <laughs> all right. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>